I said, hallelujah. hallelujah. I miss you guys hollering back at me. And it is different. It's uh, much different ministering here without a whole lot of people here, very few people here. Um, but we're trying to be uh, uh, obedient to our government regulations right now. So, But we want to just thank you for being here. And uh, you've heard me say this before. We have the best church in Hampton Roads, Virginia. And it's because of you because of you you're the church the church is not the building the people are the church and we just want to say how much we do appreciate you guys for being a part of victory life well today is palm sunday and um, i want to start off in reading in matthew chapter 21 verses 1 through 11. And I believe this message this morning is God-ordained, and I think every message is, but this message is God-ordained. So make sure your hearts are receptive to receive this word this morning because I believe it will be a blessing to you. And if you have time, to tell someone on Facebook, tune in this morning and watch this service because it's going to be a blessing. Matthew chapter 21, verses 1, it says, Now when they drew near Jerusalem... And came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them. And immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. So I, I researched that, and we can go back. If you go back to Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9, Zechariah was prophesying this. It says, Rejoice greatly. This is Zechariah 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly. Greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. We see here that this was prophesied long before Jesus was actually going to enter into Jerusalem. But I want you to see four elements here. There's four elements here that decide the Messiah's character. Now listen to me. Number one, he is king. Yes. Yes. He is king of kings and lord of lords. He was being recognized that day as king of kings and lord of lords. And he is just. God is a just God. He is fair, but he is a just God, and he will judge his people. Number three, he brings with him salvation. Yes. He brings with him salvation. Think about how powerful that is. We say that a lot, but God has given his people that has chose him to be his Lord and Savior eternal life forever. This earth is just a temporary stop. Our goal is to be in heaven for eternity. Yeah, yeah. And number four, he is humble. He has come riding on a donkey. He didn't come riding on a horse. Now, in the days, the biblical days of, of, of history, we can see that the kings would often ride on horses. That was, that would show dominance. That would show, uh, it was actually a, a sign of battle. When they would go to battle, they would ride on a strong horse. But Jesus chose to ride on a donkey. Now, I don't know if you know this, but Jesus chose to humble himself to lowly, it says to lowly ride on a donkey. Now, coming in on a donkey signifies two things. He was relating to the common people. Now, he, he, it didn't diminish none of his power. But he was relating to the common people and he was relating to, he was bringing with him, he was bringing peace with him. Yeah. He wasn't coming into battle. He wasn't coming into force. He wasn't coming into con conflict. He was signifying, he was signifying the peace of God by coming in on a donkey. 
Now, let me finish this. It says here in verse 6, So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a great multitude, many people, a great multitude, spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And now later we realize they were palm trees, and that's where the day Palm Sunday comes from. They were palm trees that cut down. They threw the branches on him. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed him were crying out, Hosanna! to the son of David. Hosanna to the son of... Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the highest, or Hosanna in the highest. They were signifying him that he was king of kings, lord of lords, and he was their savior. He was their savior. And that's where we get the Palm Sunday from. Just like Palm Sunday was the beginning of to the end of Jesus' reign here on this earthly ministry, I believe that we are living in a season that is beginning of sorrows that will lead us to the rapture of Christ or that will lead us to the second coming of our Lord and Savior. Yeah. Now, if you haven't been here, I know Pat, my dad said that Pastor Jason is going to finish, uh, he's going to be on part three this Wednesday night of talking about end times and how we're in the season of the beginning of sorrows. It's been a phenomenal teaching on that, so I encourage you to tune in. But I want to steal some of that this morning. And it says, uh, I'm going to read in verse uh, Matthew 24, 3 through 8. And it says, Now... As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things be? Now, if you remember, they were talking about the end times, his second coming, the rapture of the church. And it says, tell us when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of age? And Jesus answered and said to them, the first thing he said was, take heed that no one deceives you. Now, I've been meditating on that and studying on that. Take heed that no one deceives you. Deception is going to be rampant in these last days. Now, as you can remember, Deception was the first tool that the enemy used against Adam and Eve. Yeah. He deceived them. He's the father of deception. Yes, he is. And he still uses that today and especially in these end times. The closer we get to the rapture of Christ, the more that he's going to pull out deception and be deceiving his people. And we got to protect ourselves from that. Now, I was flipping through the other day or a couple days ago or maybe three days ago, and I was I come across one of these magic shows on TV. Now, I'm not obsessed with magic, but I think it's interesting to see how they do certain things. And I was watching these guys was doing some card tricks and stuff, and one thing's for sure, there is deception involved. Excuse me. There is deception involved in doing magical card tricks. Amen. But what I want to show you is the deception comes when, when they get you to focus on something. They get you to focus in one particular area. And then all of a sudden, the manifestation of the trick is exposed. And you can't figure out how that's happened. But he, has de but he was using deception to get you to focus on what he didn't want you to focus on. So that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. See, the deception is rampant. The devil's using deception, deception today. He is using deception against us today. In other words, he, he gets us focusing on something, and when we focus on something, then we miss maybe what God has for us, or we miss what God has planned for our life. And, and in other words, we can actually miss the purpose of what God has placed inside of us if we spend more time focusing on certain areas, pleasure, rather than seek first the kingdom of God. Now, let me move on. And verse 5 says, many will come in my name, 
saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Verse 7, for nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. We already see that. We've been in wars for a long time. Nations coming against each other. We're in wars. Nations are in wars. And kingdom again. And there will be famines. It didn't say there might be famines. There will be famines. There will be pestilences and earthquakes in various places. Now, pestilence, as Pastor Jason said, is a deadly or viral epidemic disease. I'm here to tell you, we're living in the world of pestilence right now. Yeah, yeah. Right now, we're living in the season of pestilences and earthquakes. And all these things are the beginning of sorrows which will lead to the coming of our Lord and Savior. Now, we need to do our part, and we should pray against that. We should pray and we bind that spirit of, of uh, corona or COVID-19 virus. We bind it and we should. But there's more to that than just praying. Now, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. My, my, my. This is getting ready to get good. Look to your neighbor and say, this is going to be good. <laughs> All right, let's go to chapter 7, verses. Let's start with verse 13. And it says here, When I shut up heaven, and this is when the Lord appeared to Solomon, so the Lord was saying this. He says, When I shut up heaven, and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people. Now, I'm not saying that he sent this pestilence. I'm not saying he sent this virus. But the fact is, it is here. The pestilence is here. And he gives us a remedy how to deal with it. Verse 14, it says this. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, yes. pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then... I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Yes, amen. My, 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 my. So there is more to just praying. There is one, two, three, four commandments here. Number one, you got to humble yourself. Now, this is not multiple choice. This is not we can do one out of four things here. This is, it says we got to humble ourselves we got to pray and seek our face and turn from their wicked ways. In other words, we got to repent. We have to repent from our sins. Now, you might be thinking, well, I haven't been doing, uh, I haven't committed adultery. I haven't been committed to fornication. He's, not, he's talking about sin. Whatever sin is in your life, you need to repent from it. Now, like what Isaac Petrie said, he said, now, now repent is not going to Jesus and telling him how sorry you are. Yes. That is not what repent is. Repent is a change of heart to completely turn away from what you were doing that was sin. To, in other words, ha have a, a new train of thought. Change your thought life. Come on now. That's good right there. Change your thought life. Amen? <coughs> I'm preaching a little harder than I want to preach this morning. But let me, let me, let me just say this. We have, uh, uh, as a child of God, we have a responsibility. When we have seen that we have been, before this all started, we have been in an uh, 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 area of all about pleasure. We have lived our lives about pleasure and entertainment. All that is now shut down. And never in history, never in history, and probably never happened again, where everybody is in the same battle. Everybody is believing God for the same thing, for this virus to be shut down. That has never happened before in history. But I'm telling you, God somehow is going to get the glory through all of this. In order for that to happen, we got to do some changing. We got to reset. 
We got to refocus and we got to readjust some things in our own lives. We got to examine ourselves. I believe this is a time for us to re examine ourselves and see what are we putting first in our life. What is priority to us? We need to look at our priorities. God wants us to seek Him first, seek the kingdom of God first. God is your first priority. Amen? And I know we all can make some adjustments in that area, including myself. Amen? So we need to make sure we look at ourselves and make those adjustments. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the kingdom of darkness. For those who don't know, there is a kingdom of darkness. You're either in one of two categories. You're even worshiping or you're even a slave to the kingdom of darkness or you're even a slave to the kingdom of righteousness. There's not an in-between. At the end, you're either going to heaven or you're going to hell, basically what I'm saying. There's two categories. Matthew 4, verses 8 and 10, it says, Again, this is when, uh, when the devil took Jesus up to the mountain when he was fasting for 40 days. He said, Again, the devil took him up an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Notice here, he showed him the kingdoms of the world. The devil is the king. He is, he is the kingdom of this world. He is the God of this world. The devil is the God of this world. Make sure you understand that. Now, he said to them, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. And Jesus said, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall not worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. But the point I'm trying to make is that the Satan, when he was in heaven, he rebelled against God. He wanted the same authority, and he wanted more authority than what God had. That's what got him where he's at today. He got kicked out of heaven, him and a third of his party, a third of the angels were kicked out of heaven because he wanted to be better or equal to God. And that God wouldn't stand for that. Amen? But when he kicked him out of heaven, he became the God of this world. Because in Genesis, he deceived Adam and Eve. See, we were designed to yield to the Spirit. When God created Adam and Eve... We were designed to yield to the Spirit. But when Adam and Eve fell, they sinned, they be cut off spiritually. Then we started, being, uh, we started being people that yield to the flesh instead of yielding to the Spirit. So let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. There is a kingdom of darkness, and Satan is the father of it. It says, therefore, since we have this ministry... As we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. Listen to this. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame. What we have renounced, we have, renounced means to turn away from, to repent. We have repented from the hidden things of shame. And shame means, refers to, listen, secret immoralities, hypocrisies, and the sins that are hidden deep in the darkness of one's life. But we have repented from the hidden things of sin or the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully. That means there are people today, there are so-called Christians today that are interpreting the Bible so they can live the lifestyle that they're living. Let me say that again. There are people that are being deceived by what the Word of God says. See, when, when, when the enemy wants to attack, he's going to use deception to do it. So when he wants to attack something, he wants to destroy something, the enemy is going to redefine what it is. Now, I said this before. He redefined what murder is. See, he allowed abortion to take place, and now it's become a normal thing. I'm going to get into that a little bit later, but let's move on. It says, uh, handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Verse 3, but even if our gospel is veiled, 
even if the gospel is veiled, which means it's either hidden or covered, even if the gospel is hidden or covered, it is veiled or it is hidden to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. Let me go back and see that again. But even if our gospel is hidden, it is hidden to those who are perishing. See, those who are born again, those who, who have received Christ as the Lord and Savior, that go to a word church, especially those of Victory Life Church family, you are taught the uncompromised word of God. So there are people that are being deceived because they want uh, a scripture that they can interpret to fit their lifestyle. But it says this, it is hidden, it is covered to those who are perishing the deceitfulness whose minds the God of this age has blinded. Who is the God of this age? It is Satan. The God of this age, which is the God of this earth, the God of this age has blinded who do not believe unless the light of the gospel, the light, the true word of the gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. There's only one way to get to heaven. That's receiving Christ as your Lord and Savior and being obedient to his word. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. But thank God for salvation. Thank God for salvation and that we can repent and turn our, life, our lives over to Christ. Amen. Amen. The kingdom, let me, let me talk about the kingdom of darkness here. The kingdom, the kingdom of darkness is, is that sphere of influence where Jesus is not really your Lord. It is the realm in which people worship something or people worship someone other than Jesus. It could be self-centeredness. Let me say it again. It could be self-centeredness in which a person is only seeking their own desires. It is seeking after someone or something whom we consider more important than Jesus. Oh, come on now. Yeah. Anything we put ahead of God, we have put more influence on rather than God becomes our God. That is modern-day idolatry. Anything we put ahead of God. Amen? So the master of this kingdom is Satan. The word says that he can come, talking about Satan, he can come as or manifest himself as an angel of light. Or he can manifest himself as anything that is attracted to us. See, the, even the enemy knows what you're attracted to. Yes, he does. Because what you spend your time and in your energy and resources in is going to be important to you. So the enemy knows what he can attract you with or what he can tempt you with. Right. Amen? So it says to get us to focus our attention on whatever that may be, that's what the enemy does. He gets us to focus ourselves on what we think is important to us. And if we're not careful, we can find ourselves putting more time and energy into whatever it is rather than seeking the kingdom of God first. Pleasure, uh, sports, theater, Hollywood. There's many things that we can spend a lot of time in that can sneak up on us and it can become modern day idolatry. Amen? So, in other words, you can allow good things to become God things. So we got we to gotta be careful. And, and th this is a time that we're living in where right now everybody's in timeout, pretty much. I know there's some people still working and things, but a lot of the majority of the world is shut down, especially in the United States. We're living in a time that we just, hey, let's just, I believe God is saying to us, let us reset, let us refocus, and let's readjust some things in our life. Because this is just temporary. We're going to get through this. But we need to come through this stronger. I've already made up my mind. My bank account's going to be more money in my bank account than it was before we went into this. You have that authority to do that. God has placed that ability inside of you. I'm going to come, in strong. I'm going to come through this stronger in faith. Oh, we're going to talk about faith in just a minute. <laughs> but deception here. Let's look at um, 
Matthew 24, you don't have to look at it, but Matthew 24, 4 says, And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. I, wanna, I just want to make you understand deception is going to be rampant. Matthew 24, 24 says, Even the elect of God is going to be deceived. Yeah. There's going to be t teachers and preachers that are, uh, that are high profile that will be deceived in these last days. But I encourage you to stick with what the Word of God says. Amen? See, like I said before, when the enemy wants to change something, he wants to attack something, he wants to redefine it. And we as society don't need, especially Christians, we have been sitting back too long and allowing the world to take over what we truly believe and what not believe. We don't need to, it, Romans chapter 1 verse 32 says that, talks about sexual immorality, talks about women desiring women, how enemy has changed their hearts to, to wickedness other than what God created. God created a man and woman. He created a husband and wife. He didn't create a woman to marry a woman. He didn't create a man to marry a man. The enemy was responsible for that. He has redefined what marriage is. He has redefined what sex is. Sex is between a husband and a wife. You're not even supposed to have sex before you get married. We don't even talk about that anymore because it's uh, what they call normality now. Everybody's doing it. Well, just because everybody's doing it don't mean it's what God created it to have do. The devil has redefined what family is. My wife was telling me last night there's some rich guy who's trying to do away with the word family. Completely do away with what family is. I'm telling you, God ordained marriage. He ordained sex between a husband and wife, and he ordained family. Abortion came because of sin. There's nothing you can say to me that's just going to get me to say that abortion is okay. It's going back to human sacrifices. Back in the biblical days when it was rampant. I'm telling you, man, we, we got to readjust some things. We got to refocus our mind and get our mind renewed to the things of God. We have been stuck in this pattern of we're allowing the world to just pass us by and they want to just, you got to accept it or not. I'm not accepting it. I'm going to stand up and preach against it. And if you don't like it, I'm sorry. I'm going to stand before God, and he's going to say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. I'm not going to compromise what the word of God says. Amen. I want to redefine what a boy is. They got boys wanting to be girls, and girls change them into boys. That, that is not of God. Amen. I lost my place. I don't know where I'm at now. <laughs> you preaching. If God is not the first priority in our lives, then we're basically rebelling against what God says. This attitude is what the Bible calls sin because the essence of sin is rebelling against what God's Word says. And when that happens, we are following, now listen to me, we are following Satan to deceive us and to think that it falls under the category of normality. Now, you got to be careful because Romans 1, chapter 32 says, those who practice such things deserving of death, but it also says not only those who practice of it, but those who are in agreement with it. If you agree to it, if you say, think it's okay, then you're deserving of the same punishment. Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. There is a kingdom of darkness. Amen. Hallelujah. And 1 John chapter 5, 19 says that we know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. That's scripture. The whole world lies in the power of Satan. But we can't allow Satan to manifest his, uh, his thinking or his agenda to our Christians. We got people on Facebook, Christians, arguing with each other. We should be all in one accord. We should believe the same word of God. There's only one Bible. We should be in agreement that well, his word is yes, true, and amen. <clears throat> but thank God for Romans, Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. 
Hallelujah. This is the end result here. It says this, Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of us his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. The end result is the kingdom of God dominates the kingdom of this world. There will be no kingdom of this world except for God at the end time. Amen. So at the end, we are winners in Christ. We have already won. But I want to make sure that you don't get deceived by lack of knowledge. So what do we do? I'm glad you asked me that. We stay strong in faith. Amen. I know that's a cliche statement, but it's true. We've heard it over again. You continue to hear it even more so. Stay strong in faith. Now, our faith is going to be tested. Our faith is being tested now. If there's ever a time to stay strong in faith, it is right now. Yeah. Now, let me say this. Don't let your faith get weaker because of how long this pandemic lasts. Amen. Stay strong. Don't let your faith get weaker because of how long. Don't look at it and say, well, how come this is happening? We got people that are praying against this virus and it continually happens. You've heard me say this over and over again. There's going to be things that happen that you don't understand. This is Bible prophecy being fulfilled. Just like it was when Zechariah said that Christ is coming riding on a donkey. Later on, Christ came to Jerusalem riding on a donkey, signifying he was the king of kings and lord of lords. There's going to be things that happen you will not understand. But you still stay strong in faith. Amen. I like what Miles Monroe said. He said, don't put your faith in the activities of God because he may not act the way you expect. I like that. Don't put your faith in the activities of God because he may not act the way you expect. So who do you really trust? Are you trusting in God or are you trusting in his, his blessing? Mm, that didn't go over too good. All right. That means don't put your faith in what God does or does not do. You put your faith in Almighty God. Amen. Amen? That means you put your faith in his purpose is not always, this is his purpose is not always visible from our vantage point. His purpose is not always visible for what we can see. God has a purpose through all this. God is going to get the glory through all of this, but his purpose is always greater than what we can see. God is looking for people of faith. He's, in Luke 18, 8 says, When the Son of Man comes, will we really find faith on the earth? When he comes, when he's right, will he really find faith on the earth? I encourage you to stay strong. Get stronger in faith. We start off preaching that the first time in January. Stronger in 2020. Don't let this epidemic weaken your faith. Amen. Your faith is only as strong as the test it survives. So you could say that testing is a necessity of faith. I think it was Miss Willworth said this. I could be wrong. But I think he said, if your faith has never been tested, then you're not living by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. But if your faith has never been tested, then you need to check yourself and see if you're living by faith. Amen? I remember this story. I've told this before. Um, I believe it was Miles Monroe went on a plane ride. And he sat beside this gentleman, and they drew up a conversation. And the gentleman told him, he said, what do you do? And the gentleman told him, I, I test aircraft engines and I test uh, motor mobile engines. And Miles Monroe said, well, why is it necessary to test a new car or a new engine or an aircraft engine? And he said this, he said that every credible manufacturer invests in testing their products in order to guarantee its performance. He also said that testing was necessary to establish the measure of trust that you can promise. See, it's easy to trust God when things are going right. It's easy to stay in strong in faith when you don't need faith. 
But right now, we all need faith. We all need to stand strong in faith because faith is what's going to get us through this and it's going to get us stronger in this when we come out of it. Amen. Amen? So we got to understand, see, can God put his purpose on you? Can God say, my purpose for you is this when you can't even act strong in faith? When you don't even operate in faith? So we got to make sure that we keep our hearts right. We keep our hearts right standing with God, not just praying and seeking God, which we should do, but we should humble ourselves, but we also should turn from our wicked ways. That means we got to repent from those things that have been dragging us down. And it may not be all bad things. It may be some good things we put and made them God things. Amen? See, God allows your faith to be tested. He does allow your faith to be tested. Then you, why would you even need faith for if your faith was never tested? See, he tested Job. He allowed Satan to rip Job of everything. He lost his whole family. He lost his whole, all his farm, his cattle, his crops. He lost everything. But what Job did not do, he maintained his faith in God. And what did he do with Job? He restored double portion of what he had before. He had double the kids. He had double the livestock. He had his crops doubled. He was in, he, he, he I'm telling you people, God is going to get the glory through this. You're going to be stronger in faith. You're going to be financially secure when all this is over. Hallelujah. Because untested faith is not valid faith. Untested faith is not valid faith, and it won't mount too much. But have faith in God because he has given us everything we need. Let me finish this on a good note. I know you all want to finish on a good note. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. I don't want to leave you with a little bad taste in your mouth, but if, it's, if it makes you make some adjustments, then you need to have a bad taste in your mouth. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Let me read this in closing. Let me, let me finish with this. It says this. So those who have obtained light, precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's talking about those that have obtained light faith, precious faith, by the righteousness of God, by being in right standing with God. That means being obedient to his word. Verse 2 says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of our Jesus, our Lord, as his divine power. See, this epidemic has not depleted God's power at all. Amen. His divine power has given to us all things, not some things. He's given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his glory and virtue. He called us by his glory and virtue. Don't forget the word virtue. It means a uh, practice of moral excellence. So when we're a child of God, we should practice being righteousness with God. Yes. But we have everything we need because he has given us the divine power to meet all our needs. So you don't have to fret over it. Like Dad said, you don't have to operate in fear whatsoever because this too shall pass. Yes, it will. But we got to look at ourselves and our own lives, examine ourselves yes. and see how we can re reset things, we can readjust, we can refocus some things and we can, and we can uh, uh, refocus and we can readjust some things. Make those adjustments in our own life. We have plenty of opportunity yeah. to think about how we can become a better Christian, how we can serve Christ better, how he can look at us and say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Because don't get so uh, isolated that you don't stay connected to the things of God. Don't get so isolated that you don't stay connected to the things of God. Now, I'm not, I know Victory Life Church people are, are phenomenal. They're staying connected with us, but it's still, you got to stay connected to God. You got to spend time reading the Word. You got to spend time praying in the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Amen. 
because we want to see things change in our society. And for order for God to get the glory through this, we as Christians got to make some changes. Amen. Amen. Well, hallelujah. I'm going to end right there, but I want to say thank you for joining us today. Uh, we miss you guys. We love you guys. But we're going to keep coming to you every Sunday and Wednesday. Of course, we have proclaimed the victory on 11 o'clock on Tuesdays now. But um, we want you to stay connected with us, and we love you guys. We thank you so much for all you Victory Life Church families that support us. And we say God bless you. We love you. Go have a best day, and God is good all the time. All the time. Amen.